Let's do some more examples. Let's say a headphone company's sales S in dollars when they sell each pair of headphones for P dollars is given by S equals G of P equals 240 times P minus P squared. Look very carefully how I read that sentence. G of P equals 240 times P minus P squared. It is important to read all the operations you see so you understand what is happening. All right, so you are asked to identify independent dependent variables and then evaluate G of 50 and G of 250 and tell us what it means. So go ahead, you do part A, then we'll discuss it, then you'll do part B, and then we'll discuss it again. So go ahead, pause the video, see what you can do. Don't just wait there for my answers, you know the drill. Go ahead. All right, assuming you've come back, we have S equals G of P, which is 240 times P minus P squared. So our P is our input variable, and our S is the output variable. So P is independent variable, S is dependent variable. Don't just move on. Look very carefully where all the different places the input appears. 240 times P minus P squared. Those are two different places that we have input appearing, which means that if I want to evaluate G of 50, I'm going to have to replace all my inputs with 50. So that's the next part, part B. Let's take a look at that. All right, so in this part B, I want to replace all the inputs with 50 to compute G of 50. So I'll replace G of 50. All the places that got 50 as input gets the input, and then use your calculator to evaluate the final answer, which would be 9,500, and that would be my output. So G of 50 is 9,500. But it's not just important to compute functions. You need to know what this means. Well, what does it mean? What does the 50 represent? P was 50. P is the price. So if you sold headphones for $50 per headphone, you are going to make 9,500 units sale. So you sold 9,500 headphones if you set the price at $50 per headphone. All right, go ahead, compute G of 200. So all the inputs now will get replaced with, good, 200. So replace all the inputs with 200. Use your calculator, tell me what that is. Go ahead. Someone says 8,000, so that's correct. G of 200 would be 8,000. Oh, what does that mean? That means if I set my price $200 per headphone, I have sales of 8,000. You should always try and see if it makes sense to you. What is happening here? If the price is lower, you sold more headphones than if the price was 200. All right, you do this next problem. Compute G at 50, 100, and so on. Go ahead, do it on your own. All right. We have G of 0, you plug in 0 for P. You have 50, which we already did. 100, you plug in 100 for P. 150, 200, and 240. So we have all of these. Another way we can represent a function is in tabular form. So tabular form, you have P column and S column. When price is 0, S is 0. Price is 50, S is 9,500, and so on. So we have our list here, and the tabular form kind of gives you a picture of what's happening. So someone should have a very good question posed for me here. So when you look and when you solve problems, you should constantly be thinking about questions you would like to ask. That's what a mathematician does. That's what a researcher does. 
they're like, oh, look at this. I got g of 0 is 0, g of 240 is 0. Looks like the price, the number of headphones you sold went up, up, up. And then it started going down again. So you would want to know what? You would want to know what is the optimal price that we should have to have maximum sales. That would be a natural question that we should ask. But we cannot see that unless you take your function and do something different, represent it a little differently. So that is, if you have the function here, we already had a tabular representation. So the next part is graphical representation. If you represent the data on a graph, so out of necessity, you can see how we try to represent our functions in different ways to answer different questions. Well, how do we represent uh, data on a graph when you have two input and an output? That's two-dimensional relationship. So we would want to represent that in the Cartesian plane. So that means you have a x-axis and a y-axis, in this case a p-axis and an s-axis because you're using the letters P and S instead of X and Y. So here's my rectangular coordinate system. The convention for graphical representation is that you display the independent variable on the horizontal axis and dependent variable on the vertical axis. So our sales would be on the vertical and price in dollars would be on the horizontal axis. So this point, zero, zero. The, where the two axes intersect, that's 0, 0. So let's plot our coordinates. So we have 0, 0, 50, and 9,500, 100, and 14,000, 150, and 13,500, 200 is 8,000, and 240 is 0. So you can see that this way of representing the data into a graphical form allows us to see a pattern. You can see it goes from 0, goes up, turns around, and comes back down, which means it reaches its maximum. So to find what that actual maximum point is algebraically, you will learn a little bit later in the semester. If the curve is more complicated, then you will have to take calculus to figure out how to find the maximum for that particular curve. But this is a quadratic function. Quadratic means power two function. So you can easily see what the maximum is if you were to graph it on a graphing utility, like a graphing calculator. There are lots of free apps like desmos.com, Wolfram Alpha, many, many others. So let's show you how to use Desmos because we'll be using it throughout the semester. When you first get to the Desmos website, it will look like this. On the left-hand side is where you can enter your function, g of p equals. To get a square, you have to go shift 6 and 2. That will give you p squared. On top of that function, you will see a little wheel. If you click on it, you will see a little table. So you can create a table, tabular representation of your function. So you will have to enter the coordinates. And you can see it automatically understands what G is. So we had some of our points. We have 50, 100, 150, 200, and 240. Now, you cannot see anything on the right-hand side. You just see like a line. It's partly because you don't have the right viewing window. To adjust the viewing windows, do you see this little toolbar settings, like a wrench tool? Click on that. If you click on projector mode, it makes it a little darker. You can put labels on sales. Now, to adjust the window, just pick the right window. Remember, our x went from 0 to 240. So to make sure we have the correct window, we'll go like negative 100 to 300. Our y coordinates go from 0 to like 14,000. So let's make that negative 1,000. And here we'll make it 15,000. If your color is not black and you want to change the color, you can go here 
to your function, click press down on it and you'll see all the different colors to change it. You can see from your graph now that at the peak, if you click on it, it will give you 120 and 14,400 as your highest point, which means to get optimal sales, you'll have to set the price for headsets to 120 per headset and then you will make 14,400 sales. So you can see the power of graphing utilities to enhance learning and get a little more deep insight into your problem. So when we connected our dots, we got the following graph and our point here, which was 120. So 120 is the price that we would set for maximum sales. So again, our dependent variable is on the vertical axis, independent variable on the horizontal axis. 